Loversidge Jr. is an architect and president and CEO of Schooley Caldwell here in town. Bob's strength has been in his ability to work with a client to quickly identify a vision for complex projects and then lead the design team in implementing the vision. Almost 40 years ago, you may remember this, Bob, who was in his early 20s at the time, and a few others stopped the surprise Friday night demolition of the Daniel Burnham Union Station Arch. With a midnight temporary restraining order, the first time this had ever been done using federal historic preservation legislation. And then 20 years later, Schooley Caldwell was responsible for designing the move of the arch from its location to its current location at McPherson Commons. Bob has earned a national reputation as an expert in historic preservation design through more than three decades of architectural practice. His passion is for the preservation um, continues through his work at four state capitals and numerous other historic buildings. <laughs> he is most proud to have been the architect for both the Ohio State House Restoration and the Thomas J. Moyer Ohio Judicial Center. He's the founder and past president of the Columbus Landmarks Foundation, past chair of the advisory group of the National Historic Resources Committee of the AIA, and past president of the Ohio Preservation Alliance. In 2015, Bob was inducted into the Association of Ohio Commodores, which is a group of individuals recognized by the governor of Ohio with the state's most distinguished honor. Bob received his Bachelor of Science in Architecture and a Master of Architecture from The Ohio State University. And Bob, I tried to do a little research on Bob, and there's not much gossip out there. I tried. <laughs> but what I do notice, and you will notice, is Bob always is wearing black. And it's not because he likes his favorite undertaker. It's just Bob is always in black. I've never asked him why. I can only assure, I can only assume he's a Johnny Cash fan. <laughs> and why does my appearance seem to have a somber tone? Well, there's a reason for the thing. So help me welcome the other home. man in black, Bob Lover's Edge, to Columbus Rotary. Okay, now I have an opening on my marketing staff, so uh, uh, you're welcome to take it. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today to talk to you about one of my favorite subjects, which is the renovation of historic buildings. And in this case, the building is the Levesque Tower, which is um, really an icon in our city. It has been an icon in our city for many, many years. And we've had the privilege of working on it now for oh, six or seven years, I think, to try to give it... Uh, another 100 years life and I think that's uh, that process is well underway and uh, this is what this talk is about. Uh, I hope you can see the images over here because um, uh, some of them are pretty pretty telling. So the AI, the, the, the Levesque Tower started its life as the AIU Citadel. The American Insurance Union was a fraternal organization headquartered in Columbus that happened to offer life insurance to its members. That's a critical thing, by the way, because the state had a rule, had a law, that said insurance companies couldn't go out and spend all their money on big headquarters buildings. So they convinced the, uh, the state that they weren't an insurance company. They were a fraternal organization that offered insurance to its members. They promptly built a very tall building and went out of business because that's why you shouldn't do that. Anyway, uh, in, in 1927, uh, this building uh, was built. And, and clearly, it was the entire skyline of Columbus for many, many years. It was the only uh, building that would be seen for miles around, and, and people still uh, ask me about it when I travel around the country. Uh, but it was, it, it was and is an icon. And even today, when it's surrounded by buildings that are uh, approximately the same size, it's no longer the tallest building in the city, but it's very close to the tallest building, and certainly it's one of the most distinctive buildings uh, on our skyline today. It was the fifth tallest building in the world when it was built. It was sort of an interesting uh, sideline. So the corner of uh, front and uh, broad didn't always look like that. And this is actually a, a photograph of that corner before the construction began. So you can see 
kind of the scale of our city at the time that, uh, that this building was being built. Uh, here it is under construction, uh, uh, an aerial shot. And this is interesting because you can see also um, on the lower left, uh, the city hall, first phase of city hall is being built and they're just doing the excavation. So these kinds of photographs are really kind of fun to see the, the evolution of our city. But anyway, the AIU Citadel was the invention of this man. Uh, John J. Lentz was an entrepreneur. He was a social reformer. Uh, he was offering, for instance, life insurance to, to families at, at, at a time when this was kind of a new thing. Uh, he was a politician. He was in the uh, Congress for a little while. He also owned 25% of the site on which the building was built. But that's kind of a, you real estate guys would probably get that, uh, why this is a good idea. So the program for the building was pretty simple. He needed a new office building for AIU, which needed about, oh, maybe two floors of the building that was ultimately built. But his ego was bigger than that. And so he decided and, and made a deal, a really good deal, I think, with the, uh, the hotel next door. On the corner of Broad and High, there was a hotel called the Deschler Wallach Hotel. It was a 400-room uh, luxury hotel that uh, was on the corner, had been there 20 years or so, and, and needed to be expanded. And Lentz cut a deal to put 600 additional rooms onto that hotel so that there would be a 1,000-room hotel. He also, don't we talk every other day in Columbus about wishing we had a thousand room hotel? Well, we had one at one time. Uh, and then he also made a deal to, to put a theater on the site. So this is a major mixed use building uh, of the type that we see much later all over the country, uh, pretty early on. So the architect was uh, this man, C. Howard Crane from Detroit. And the, he's interesting because he was known for doing movie palaces, the big elaborate, like um, the palace or like the uh, Ohio Theater kind of movie palaces all over the country. As far as I know, he had never done a tall building. But he got the commission uh, f to do this building. And oddly enough, he didn't do the Palace Theater. Uh, that was done by Thomas Lamb, uh, who uh, also a little bit later did the Ohio Theater. And Lamb was a, a very popular, uh, a very prominent architect in the theater business as well. But we've never sort of sorted out why that all happened like that. Nevertheless, here we are um, uh, laying the cornerstone. And take a look at the, some of the steel that's already been installed. Uh, it is massive. It's bridge steel, <coughs> great big pieces, hot, uh, hot uh, riveted together. Uh, we've actually seen some of that during the renovation because we've had to uncover it and, and make some changes and so forth. It's pretty amazing. And, and here we are under construction. Um, I, I think that picture was probably taken before OSHA. Um, but this guy is really way up high uh, working on the skin of the building. And here it is when it's uh, about complete. You can see that City Hall and the uh, old police station are also complete about the same time. The riverfront was beginning to develop and Levesque kind of lorded over uh, all of it. And when it opened, it was a very, very big deal. There were parades, there were plays, there were uh, performances in the theater. There, were, um, there was a song written about uh, the Levesque, which I'm not going to sing for you. Uh, but it was pretty impressive. And, and in their literature, they called it the king of buildings. And when you think about other buildings in Columbus at that time, the details and the, and the uh, uh, attention to detail, the materials, the richness of it was all pretty, pretty spectacular. Now, this is an advertisement for the Dessler Wallach Hotel that advertises itself uh, with a thousand rooms and a thousand baths too. And that's that's pretty pretty <laughs> significant. Um, but uh, so if you look at the at the Levesque, you see the the first 19 floors more or less lines up with the um, uh, with the hotel, and that's you you reach those rooms by a bridge from uh, the the Dessler Wallach Hotel over to um, the AIU Citadel. So I, I mentioned the ego of, of John Lentz, and it's not um, um, really a coincidence here. It's, it's kind of for real. We are 555 and a half feet tall. The, the Washington Monument is 555 feet tall. We were deliberately built to be taller than the Washington Monument. Uh, and, and you know, that's, that's pretty kind of amazing. So uh, among other things, this, uh, this building became a beacon for early aviators. Uh, at the beginning, of course, the planes didn't fly at night. But when they started to fly at night, we didn't want to run into the building. And, and also, the, the, the beacons were 
uh, used as kind of an aerial lighthouse for, uh, for that. And to think about the importance of this building in that regard and also the importance of uh, uh, early transportation in Columbus, uh, uh, we were the place where the first coast-to-coast -coast travel took place. Uh, we had a, a, a system called Trans, uh, Transcontinental Air Transport, TAT. You may be familiar with the TAT restaurant on the east side. On the east side. They have a lot of photographs from this period. Uh, but TAT ran a rail and air service from New York City to Los Angeles that got there in half the time that the train would take you there. They did that by flying during the day uh, and, and taking a train during the night because they didn't fly at night at that time. And Columbus was the first stop. And I, I think uh, if we can make this thing go, uh, this is kind of a fun little excerpt from a newsreel from that period. Columbus, Ohio. Dinner, bedtime. Breakfast the next morning, and then, a few minutes later, the Airway Limited pulls into Port Columbus, where our first day of flying will begin. At each of these air terminals, we find unexpected comforts and conveniences, beautifully appointed restrooms, and courteous attendants who look after our traveling needs. Here at Port Columbus, our baggage is weighed. 30 pounds is the allowance. It is 8.15 in the morning now, time to take off. The big tri-motor all-metal plane is ready and waiting, equipped like a Pullman car. Its roomy cabin is well lighted and heated in wintertime. Seated in our comfortable chairs, we are all set now to see America best. The field rushes by, then all is flowing smoothly. The city of Columbus, Ohio quickly passes under us with a majestic skyscraper serving notice on air travelers that other cities beside New York have their symbols of America reaching upward. So uh, that, uh, that uh, clip actually takes you all the way from Penn Station to, uh, to uh, Los Angeles and it's really kind of interesting. Uh, Lindbergh, Charles Lindbergh was part of the TAT organization and I think when they're flying over Kansas somewhere, he flies by and waves to them in an open cockpit plane. <laughs> and at the end, uh, when they land in Los Angeles, they're uh, greeted by Amelia Earhart. So uh, this, this, uh, this whole thing is a, a really interesting part of Columbus history. It really didn't have much to do with Levesque Tower, except I thought the, the, the movie was kind of cool in the way that it showed the importance of this building. And how uh, they didn't point out any buildings like that in any of the other cities as they went across the... the uh, 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 across the country. So at any rate, uh, uh, things change, right? And, and so 1927, AIU is on the top of the world. They've got two floors uh, in this building. They've got this hotel going. Uh, the Great Depression hits. Um, they've invested way too much money in a building. And in uh, 1937, the AIU goes bankrupt. Um, my understanding is that when that happened, some of the policies that were uh, there went to another insurance company and then to another insurance company, and they may be somehow uh, buried in the uh, nationwide uh, family somewhere. Uh, but at any rate, uh, uh, 1945, the building was sold to Leslie Levesque and John Lincoln. And uh, there they are. Now, Leslie Levesque was a, uh, a local entrepreneur. Um, you may be familiar with the family. They made their money in a very interesting way. Leslie Levesque acquired uh, the patent for the automatic pin spotter that you'll find in every uh, bowling alley in the country. And, uh, and then he became a, a, an entrepreneur and a developer uh, in Columbus. John Lincoln was an electrical contractor in Cleveland, and I have no idea how they got together or why they bought the building, but they got a good price for it because it was, uh, the building had been in bankruptcy, and uh, pretty soon they uh, they got it going again. The hotel was still going for a while. They made some changes to the building. Um, and then a year later, Leslie Levesque was killed in a, in a tragic plane crash. So things changed a bit. There was kind of a, 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 a corporation was built. And then in 1946, um, uh, Fred, Le Fred Levesque, who was his son, and, and Catherine Levesque, who some of you may have known, 
uh, took over the building and uh, eventually bought out the Lincoln uh, family uh, assets and so forth. But you know, time goes on and buildings get tired and they get used and the hotel eventually closed. Uh, when the hotel, first they closed the annex, which was the um, Levesque portion, then eventually the hotel itself failed and, and it was torn down. So now we've got 19 floors of a, an ex hotel to deal with. And they were converted, that's, those floors were converted into office space. The uh, ballroom, which was called the, uh, um, the, the ballroom, the name escapes me at the moment, was, uh, was filled in with a, an intermediate floor. Um, uh, and, and, and the building was renovated kind of uh, in the 1960s. They, they built a new lobby space. They took out some, uh, uh, some shops that were in that space. And, and I suppose it was a modern day kind of a thing. But the problem is when you take a hotel and make it into office space, you've got pretty small spaces and pretty low floor to floor heights. And, and now we're starting to build big buildings like um, uh, one Columbia, or like uh, Huntington Center and those kinds of things have big open floor plates. So it wasn't doing so well uh, as an office building. Um, Mrs. Levesque, Catherine Levesque took over the building uh, by herself after her husband uh, died also in a tragic plane crash. Uh, she cleaned out the Lincoln interest. She renamed the building the Levesque Tower. She renovated and updated the interior. She renovated and updated the Palace Theater and then gave it to Kappa. Uh, this is a, a wonderful gift to, to our city. Uh, and then she used the leverage of the Levesque Tower to help uh, become a participant in the development of One Columbus uh, and the Levesque parking garage on, on Front Street. So here she is uh, uh, at the Palace Theater and, and also at the announcement of the One Columbus project. So that entire uh, quarter block of, of our city was really uh, the, the redeveloped as a result of Mrs. Levesque's participation. But, you know, the office market in Columbus kind of tanked for a while. There was a, a lot of vacancy. Um, even big open f uh, floor plate buildings were being occupied or not occupied particularly well. Uh, the Levesque building kind of uh, fell into somewhat disrepair. In 2004, the Levesque family interest sold the building uh, to some out-of-town investors. Uh, a year or so later, it was sold again. So now we have the building in the hands of people that don't really understand its importance to our city. Uh, and we're not really making the kind of investment to make, uh, make the building go. So when we started looking at the building uh, for Tower 10 Limited in 2010, we've had a pretty gray building sitting on a pretty gray site in a pretty gray city, uh, pretty tired. Um, uh, you can see the storefronts are looking kind of shabby. They're probably not enticing you to come uh, put your business in this building. Uh, we started looking at the terracotta skin on the building. Uh, terracotta is a material that's sort of like a teacup. It's a, it's a fired clay material with a glaze on it. It was very popular at the time the building was built, but it does require ongoing and pretty extensive maintenance, which hadn't been done uh, in a very long time. And here you can see kind of the condition of the building. Uh, when, when we got up close, it looked too bad from a distance, but up close, some of these pieces are about to fall off. This is my colleague, Sam Rosenthal, uh, getting close and personal uh, with the building. And, and uh, inside wasn't much better. These are some pictures of, of office space. Uh, the mechanical systems were tired and, and broken down and not very efficient. Um, and yet, Columbus Underground voted, uh, and they do a survey every year, but they voted this to be the best local landmark, even in, in that condition, 2010. So in 2011, uh, the building was actually acquired by a group of local investors called Tower 10, who named themselves Tower 10. Uh, it's headed by Bob Myers, who's so shy he won't let me put his picture on the screen. Uh, Don Casto, Michael Schiff, and, and other uh, local investors put together a group of people that really understand why this building's important. And they bought it to do that, to, to bring it back because it's important, not just uh, that, that to fix it up and, and sell it. They understood the location, and the location, of course, has only gotten better in the last few years as the riverfront has redeveloped, uh, the festival uh, area uh, being right next to the Supreme Court and, and right next to the state capitol, right next to City Hall. Uh, it's a tremendous, tremendous real estate location. And so we started studying um, uh, first the outside of the building. This uh, terracotta skin 
has hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of individual glazed tiles on it, uh, and we had to survey those. We, this is not me, uh, but we hired a company that actually rappelled down the entire face of the building with cameras and computers and, and drawing pads and documented for us uh, the condition of the building. And then we started tearing it apart. We started taking out the 1960s uh, renovations, uh, the, the storefront uh, changes that had been made, the entrances that weren't working very well. Uh, we kept looking for uh, clues. Here you see some new terracotta. There are only two places in the country that actually manufacture this material, uh, one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast. Uh, they're both very good. They're both very slow. They're both very expensive. Uh, but after a very few tries, we, we got them to make a really, really exact match of the terracotta. We learned how to repair it. In most cases, we can repair the cracks and other problems with the terracotta in, in place, but in some cases, we had to make new pieces as well. Then we started looking at how this is building addressed the street. And on the left, you can see the, the original entrance. On the right, you can see the condition that it was in when we started. The truck has been updated, but the building has not been. Uh, and matter of fact, on this particular entrance, the space inside it was rented to somebody. It wasn't even an entrance any longer. So we envisioned putting back the nine-foot-high lanterns, putting back the, uh, the pizzazz and the interest of the building, uh, adding some canopies to it so that people could find and identify where the entrances are to this very, very tall building. Uh, so this is kind of what we started with on Broad Street. Uh, this is how we envisioned changing it, putting back a lot, very large windows that had been there originally, uh, replacing what had been storefronts with, uh, uh, with uh, bay windows that kind of emulate the idea of the storefronts and the scale, the materials, and, and, and kind of the elegance of the building, reinstating the entrances, uh, the two major entrances to the building, which is where they should be, uh, expanding the sidewalks a little bit, getting a little space back from the city so we could have some green uh, and, and some color at the entrances, which seemed like a really uh, big improvement. And you can see that you know, even on kind of a gray day, the change is, is pretty dramatic um, with that work. There's a before and after of this, the storefront area on, on Broad Street. Then there's the question of what to do with this building, right? I've already told you it doesn't make a very good Class A office building. But the idea of the original idea of the building, of a mixed use building, was still valid today, even more so, I think, than, than it was then. Uh, this building never had any residential uh, component in it, except for a small apartment that Mrs. Levesque uh, kept there for, for occasional use. But the idea was to turn the, the building into a mixed use building. It will always be a great address for some offices because of its location, uh, smaller offices and and, and people that want to be uh, near the Capitol or near the other uh, buildings I cited. Uh, but if we could get a hotel in there, that would give the building 24-7 vitality. So the idea of a, of a boutique hotel uh, came up. After all, it had been a hotel, right? So there's, at least the bones were, were there. And then we thought that the boom of people wanting to live downtown, the great kind of uh, deficit in downtown housing, <coughs> pardon me, uh, if we could get some apartments and maybe a few luxury condos in the building, again, it gives it vitality. It gives the people that live there access to the services of the hotel and vice versa. Um, and this would be a, a great, I've got some, thanks. Uh, this is a clean okay, thank you. I have a terrible cold. I'm sorry if you can't. <clears throat> thanks. Uh, so that was the plan, and so here's the, what the lobby looked like when we started, and this is probably a picture that makes it look nicer than it was. Uh, this is the lobby getting ready for the hotel. Uh, this building had a very small historic lobby because the lobby only serviced the offices at the very top of the tower. Now we have the, the rest of the building, which needed a lobby that was uh, appropriate to the hotel and office building, and what we tried to do there is create a space that is not really historic. It's not restoring anything that was there, but one that would be comfortable uh, on the inside of this um, Art Deco style historic building. Then we started working with um, Hotel Levesque. Hotel Levesque is a brainchild of um, First Hospitality, which is a, a company in, in Chicago that does hotels. Uh, the designer of the hotel was um, 
the Gettys Group from, from Chicago. They created the brand and, and, and started doing this uh, fabulous hotel. Here's the hotel lobby today. Uh, it's, the ho it's the lobby really for the hotel and the office building, but as you come into the building, you're welcomed by uh, this new environment, uh, a very contemporary high-end hotel. It's uh, Marriott's uh, autograph collection, if you're familiar with that. It's their high-end uh, boutique hotel. And the cool thing to us about it was it doesn't have to look like all the other autograph. Each one is, a, is its unique uh, design. And here the designers have picked up on some of the symbolism that was involved with, uh, with the original building. So it's not easy. Uh, I said it had good bones. It had been a hotel, but it also the hotel had been stripped out and the offices were pretty bad. And so this is kind of uh, how we are uh, moving along uh, with uh, demolition. Demolition is a big deal in projects like this. You demolish a lot, but you keep when anything that's, that's important. Uh, but this is what the rooms look like today. And it's quite a transformation. Uh, I haven't stayed there, but I've been in the rooms and, and they're pretty spectacular. People that do stay there come away smiling. Uh, and I think uh, it's good for those of us that live here, it'd be a great place to go for a weekend, a staycation perhaps. Uh, it's pretty spectacular. We also have uh, other aspects of the building. We have a Starbucks in the building. We work directly with the uh, uh, design teams uh, in Seattle for, for Starbucks to create uh, with a giant shoehorn, I think one of the smallest full-service Starbucks they've ever done. Uh, we had a little space. We said you can have this much space, and, and, and we had to kind of go back and forth until we got everything in. Uh, but stop in. It's in the lobby. It's easy to find. And then there's the keep. And uh, some of you were talking about, I think uh, your groups have been there already. The Keep is the bar and the restaurant in Levesque. Uh, it's up on the mezzanine level. It's kind of a cozy, dark, speakeasy kind of a place. Um, the staff is terrific. They're, they're really friendly. After you're there the first time, they remember your drink. I can attest to that. Um, and, and just a couple of weeks ago, the, the restaurant opened. And the restaurant is, is equally spectacular. It's all kind of tied together. Uh, the food is great, the service is great. One of the neat things about the restaurant is, uh, if, particularly if you're a business traveler, you, you can sit at this kind of bar that goes around the open kitchen and talk to the chefs and see what they're doing and, and all of that, which is a particularly, uh, I think, interesting aspect. Now, if you want to live at Levesque, uh, the Kaufman Development, the local uh, developer, uh, purchased the upper floors of the building and has created uh, 68, I think, uh, apartments for rent. And I think there are eight condominiums. And the apartments rented almost as fast as we could uh, get occupancy permits. Uh, the views are spectacular. There are no bad views out of that building in any direction. The apartments are kind of quirky because they're up in the, the narrow part of the tower, uh, which makes them particularly interesting. Uh, the condominiums, some of them are two floors um, with an internal stair, and, and they're, they're kind of fun. Um, and so I encourage you, uh, if you're at all interested in that, to go take a look. Once again, um, one of the things the builders may, may not have thought of on day one is, hey, our site starts 19 floors in the air. <laughs> and so <clears throat> the logistics of, of the renovation were pretty, pretty amazing. But look at the views. I mean, there, there just are no uh, bad opportunities to look out of this building. <clears throat> these are some views of, of some of the apartments and condos. And then the office space, about half the building is still going to be offices. And I mentioned that it was pretty tired. I showed you some photographs. But on the left, you can see a typical hallway with the tired carpet and, and beige finishes and very low ceilings. And on the right-hand side, you can see what we're doing with those. We're raising the ceilings. We're adding a lot of white. Bob Myers uh, really likes white. He also collects art as a, ha as a, as a hobby. And so we have lots of color, lots of interest higher ceilings, a much more elegant environment for uh, the offices at Levesque. So the Levesque Tower is no longer the only building on, on, on the skyline, but it's the one people remember. And it's an icon for our city, and it's really a significant uh, thing. Once again, it's becoming a beacon for our city, a beacon of hospitality, a beacon of, uh, uh, of good business practice. Uh, and a great building uh, on our skyline. And it's been our, our great privilege to work on this building uh, and, and also to be able to report that it's almost done. 
uh, it's been a long, a long journey. It's a journey that's been supported by the city of Columbus. It's been supported by uh, federal and state historic preservation tax credits. Um, it's, it has the incentives that are necessary to do projects like this in an urban environment. There are a lot of extra kind of expenses involved, for instance, dealing with the terracotta skin and mechanical systems and those sorts of things. And these incentives that exist and occasionally get questioned by legislatures or uh, people running for office or whatever uh, really are a tool to help us redevelop our cities. And, and it's working very, very well for, for this project. So uh, once again, the Levesque Tower is the centerpiece of our town. It's the centerpiece of Red, White, and Boom. Um, it's a great place to visit, and hope we'll see you there soon. Thank you. We do have time for questions. Okay. We do have time for questions. What did you do with the uh, penthouse? Penthouse is available for a small fee. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> the, the penthouse hasn't been redeveloped yet. Um, there was a, uh, at the very top of the building, there was actually an open observation deck that had been closed in at some point, and then another floor above that that had been a small uh, club. So many years ago, uh, John Frame, who was a, a popular uh, disc jockey, uh, renovated that space and lived there, and subsequently some other people owned it or, or leased it. It's, it's uh, vacant at the moment, and it's on our list of things to do. Yes, sir. Did you make any changes to the windows, or are they still original? The windows are the original windows. They're made of copper, which is unusual. I've seen um, aluminum, I've seen steel, I've seen bronze windows. These are actually copper, and they're in relatively good shape. Uh, we have uh, added storm windows on the inside for, in you know, for comfort, mostly, and for, for energy savings, but the windows are original. Yes, sir. Being rather ancient, I can offer three comments. One is my, during the Depression, my dad's office was on the, I don't know, 38th, 40th floor, so I can attest to the views because I used to love to go there. Second thing was this Rotary Club met at the Desler Wallet for many years before we went to the deal house. Third thing is uh, the aircraft pilots in those days referred to the Levectin uh, Lincoln Tower as the phallic symbol of the Midwest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wasn't going to mention that. They called it the prick on the prairie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you find any significant surprises architecturally or historically? Uh, we didn't find too much, uh, you know, like hidden cool stuff because, frankly, when the hotel was taken out, they did it very aggressively. Uh, the ballroom I couldn't remember the name of before is called the Hall of Mirrors, and it was uh, supposedly a one-fifth replica, scale replica of the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles. And I keep asking the owners to let me go check that out, but they, they haven't sent me. <laughs> so we didn't find that. We did find some surprises. We found. Uh, right where our entrance was going to go from the uh, entryway, new entryway to the new lobby. Uh, all of a sudden we found a five foot deep wind girder uh, of steel that we didn't know was there. And it was directly in our way. And so, and wind girders are important because they keep the building from doing this. But we didn't know they were there until we uncovered, we took down a wall and then we realized we had to cut a hole in the wind girder. That was an interesting surprise, but we had a very good structural engineer, Bill Lance, who's like the dean of structural engineers in Ohio. He put a bunch of additional steel around it so we could cut a hole in it. I think that was our biggest surprise. I mean, there are other things, obviously, in any renovation, but um, we, we kind of knew the building pretty well. Yes, sir? I assume then that you did not have original plans? We did not have, a, we have one ripped blueprint of the first floor that told us actually a lot of stuff that we needed to know. There are some fragments of structural drawings. Um, we found uh, a set of drawings that was done when the hotel was taken out and the offices were put in that kind of, if you look carefully, you could see the demolition underneath. It helped us a little bit, but we have not found the original plans. And if you find, if you have them in your basement, don't tell me now. <laughs> yes, sir. How long can a building like that last? And 
what happens when it gets to the point where it can't last any longer? Well, how long can a building like that last? As a preservationist, I'll tell you that we have buildings around the world that have lasted for thousands of years. The steel and the, and the foundations of this building are as good today as they were when it was built. Uh, the terracotta skin is somewhat fragile, so it requires a certain amount of maintenance. But assuming that it's maintained, a building like this doesn't really have a finite life. Uh, I think a renovation of the scale that we're doing uh, gives it the opportunity to, to last another hundred years, uh, with, not without, you know, without updates and changes. And mechanical systems will change, and electrical systems will change. But there's no inherent reason why it would ever have to be, uh, why it would ever be obsolete. Yes, sir. I'm a little bit confused about where the hotel was because I mean, just looking at it, you'd think that the entire Desler wall was torn down and was distinct what's left, but then the way you're talking is like part of that annex is still part of the current of that tower, so you can straighten that out. Sure. Uh, if you look at the, the configuration of the building and you see where the, the narrow tower comes down and becomes wider, uh, that's the 19th floor. So the hotel was originally on floors 3 through 19, actually 2 through 19. There were individual storefronts like a haberdasher or a drugstore or something along Broad Street uh, because there was no need for a lobby in, in uh, the Lovac Tower because everybody coming to the hotel came by a bridge. Uh, today there's a bridge that goes from uh, one Columbus over to Lovac. Well, there was a bridge there at the time, and there were ballrooms and meeting rooms and things on that floor, and then hotel rooms above it. The offices for AIU we're in the narrow, the narrow section you see above it, and then everything up in the tower was just leased office space, um, you know, small offices. So the wide section was part of the hotel? Right, the wide section was all the way, and it's L-shaped, uh, going around the theater. So that whole lower section was, were the 600 rooms that were added to the 400 that existed in the, in the uh, Deschler wallet. So then eventually when the hotel business was going down, they closed what they called the annex, which was the Levesque portion, and eventually they closed the hotel. One more. <coughs> One last thing down here. Yes. About the, uh, the terracotta skin, were there discussions about whether to just change that? Because it's so, I mean, you know, because of its. Uh, well, the uh, question is whether were there any discussions about changing out the terracotta for some other material? That might tip the scales uh, over to where the building would become obsolete because the cost of that would be so uh, overwhelming. Yeah, I mean, we're keeping most of it. I mean, the number of pieces that we're actually replacing is very small. The number of pieces that require new mortar or repairs, that sort of thing is, is greater. But it's, it's not too different from a project we're doing right now in the Rhodes Tower, which is a much newer building that has issues with its exterior skin that have to be dealt with. Okay, thank you very much. See you then. Thank you. <laughs>